Need cleaner and easy to maintain solutions for your blueprints? Check out the link in the description for 10% off. Plugins brought to you by Out of the Box. Hey there everyone, my name is Andrew for Aurora Gameworks and welcome back to another Unreal Engine 4 tutorial. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the Timeline node. Now what is the Timeline node? Well, it's a node that you can use for uh, altering certain variable uh, values or just values of any sort over a period of time. Uh, and I'll show you basically, if we go into here, into our level blueprint and add timeline. Uh, we have a whole bunch of input nodes for if we want to uh, play it, play from the start, stop reverse, etc. Um, and then we have our output node here, which is where, um, let's say we wanted to affect a certain object in the world with this, we'd be putting that in here. Um, and let's say we wanted to uh, alter a float. We would add a float track and that gets added as an output here. So what if I wanted to animate an object in the world and using the float track, we could have it move back and forth along a plane in the world. Like maybe the, the, the Y axis or something like that. Just have it moving along the ground. So. Let's add an object into the world, this cube. Uh, let's turn off its collision. And in here we can go and grab the cube and we could go set world position. Uh, is that right? Oh, sorry, not position. Excuse me set the world location pardon me now uh, if we only want to move it uh, on the y-axis we could say hey I want to get the uh, get the world location split those nodes up and then we could just put uh, X and Z in there so that uh, they will always be wherever this object is in the world that's never going to change the only thing that will change is the y-axis um, so we can add that to update. Now let's put that to play from start. Cool. So now we have our Y value here where we want our cube to move along the world like that. So let's go into our timeline and inside our float track, uh, our, our default length should be 5 seconds but you can add that to, to any length you want. Uh, at time 0, uh, hold up, what's our starting position for this? Let's just for simplicity add it so that the y, it, start, it starts at zero here, okay? So we could say this starts at a value of zero and then halfway through at two and a half seconds we could say we want that to be at 500 and then let's add another one, add that at 5 seconds and bring that back to zero. Use these buttons here so we can fit all of our keyframes onto the screen. Uh, so now we have that, it's a linear movement where it should be going back and forth on the y-axis. We can loop that so that it just keeps going and going and going. And then we can connect that float track into y here. Uh, with that being set to 500, that means that our cube should be... Uh, actually, it'll be moving in this direction, because it's in the positive of the axis. It should be moving to about there and back in about the span of 5 seconds. So, if we compile that and save that, and if we go and test it out, nothing has happened. Why has nothing happened? Okay, I just figured out the problem. It was a simple mistake by me. Um, in the world, we want to set it so that our static mesh is set to movable. Um, you know, this is something that I should have uh, remembered before filming, but that's okay. We figured it out. So we set that to movable. Um, 
so now when we are in our level it will be animating itself between uh, 0 and plus 500 on the y-axis just like I programmed it uh, something cool that I just figured out is that if we were to put the collision back onto our cube to block all dynamic um, you know basically we can step on top of this and we now have a moving platform so y again you could use the timeline um, to animate objects in the world and for instance if you are making a platformer this is great for the moving platforms to add a little bit more difficulty and motion uh, to your level um, but what if we think that the movement here is quite stiff what if we think uh, it just hits the end and it feels a little bit linear and not natural you know like then we can go back into our timeline and we can right click on our keyframes and change the interpolation so if we set all of these to auto we now have a smooth curve here and if we go back into the level you see that now when we get to uh, 0 and 500 on the axis uh, it, it goes to a smooth stop and then eases back into uh, its motion you see that's much smoother than it was before so uh, so another way that we could do this is um, what if I decided that I wanted them to start at 500 and that the middle point of our animation is at zero so now with this we could say we want it to be quite smooth uh, coming into our starting position but when it hits the other location we want it to uh, bounce quite hard like you you could imagine that if we would be that that if we were doing this vertically that it would look like a ball bouncing on the ground right so if we were to look at how it see how it looks here see it looks like it's sort of hitting something like it's bouncing up against a wall if we wanted to add in a second track that's simple all we would have to do uh, if we wanted to add another float track we just add one here and now we've got another one so how about instead of the world uh, you know like we, where it is in the world how about we uh, actually we don't need that we can just grab that down there and that's the same cool so what if we wanted to do the rotation of the object we, we wanted to animate that so what if we did a set world rotation and then split that struct uh, and then we could do the same thing like how we did with this get world location um, you know maybe we want to lock two of these axes. Um, you know how about we yeah let's work on the z axis only so we can lock our x and y so if we were to get get our world rotation, split that and plug in our X and Y so that they always stay the same and then we've got our Y here we can plug that in and connect it like that uh, and then inside the timeline in our new track uh, we could say that we want this to animate between uh, 0, 360 and then back to 0 again just like that and let's add some interpolation to it and 
and now it looks like this. What happened if we stand on it? If I can actually get onto it. Whoa. So you see here, we've just made a spinning platform and now we've created a game where the, where the player purchases a game to make themselves throw up, basically. So that's cool. Um, but what if we wanted to add in some sort of trigger in the level that would start and stop this timeline? So what if we were to create a box trigger, right? Let's make that big enough for us to stand inside. Let's make it visible for testing purposes. Cool. Uh, and with that highlighted, we could... Uh, add on begin overlap and end on overlap cast that to our player third person character now I've made this mistake in the past do not connect overlapped actor to this you want other actor like that cool and what we can do here is when we are uh, overlapped with it we can play this timeline and when we are outside of it it will stop so if we compile that and go into our level see at the moment it's doing nothing and then we go inside the box and it is animating our timeline And whenever we leave the, the trigger box area, it always stops and starts from the moment that we entered and left this trigger box. Now, if we wanted this to always start at the beginning of its timeline every time we went into the box, we could say how we want that to play from start, right? So that would look like this. It would mean that every time that we entered our trigger box area, it would always be starting from the beginning. Now that's useful if your timeline needs very specific timings in relation to what your player is doing uh, in the game. Um, but, you know, like, each of these different input nodes serve different sort of contexts and functions and whatnot. Um, what if instead of stop, uh, we did a reverse? So, that would look like this. So, you know, it's going to, boom, you know, it's going there. But if we leave, we can make it go the other way. So... You know, it looks like it's about to hit the invisible wall and bounce back to us, but if we leave the trigger area, we can just make it sort of look like it's suspended in motion and never really going anywhere. Just like that. Cool. Now, this is just a simple sort of demonstration uh, where it's just using the float tracks for positionings and rotations of objects in the world now you could use this with vector tracks which would basically be uh, you know like if we were to combine these again you know like that would be the vector track um, so rather than just getting uh, your one sort of uh, line for your keyframing. Now you'd be in here and you've got a blue, green, and red, and you can work in a sort of 3D space on a 2D graph, if that makes sense. Um, we don't want that though, so we can delete that. Um, you can also have a event track, which basically, um, imagine tying this up where you can call functions in the blueprint um, based on where the timeline is like you want to have something happen where you're calling a function 
where this is at, at the like two second point and then you want to call another function when it's at the four second point etc etc and and then you've got the color track which in theory you could use this color track to um you know when you get the power up in like mario kart the like the like one where you turn all rainbow and your and your colors are being animated going through all of the different color hues you could imagine that being connected to a looped timeline where it's just going through all the colors over and over again until um, the power up is uh, finished basically so there's a lot of things that you can do with the timeline graphs um, you know here you've just got float vector event color um, and you have a add selected curve asset I'm gonna be honest I don't actually know what this is because I've never had to use it before so I wouldn't worry about it but if you know how to do the translations between turning a float into an integer for instance or any sort of translations with the different variable types you could technically use the timelines to uh, to alter any kind of variable information that you want uh, which makes the timeline graph very very versatile um, but yeah I hope that you uh, enjoyed well that just disappeared that's probably because I disconnected this <laughs> but yes anyway I, I hope you guys enjoyed today's little tutorial video on how to use timelines um, if this was useful for you, please make sure to like the video and subscribe. Comment if you have any questions, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Uh, with that being said, I've been Andrew for Aurora Gameworks. Thank you. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.